Nine lessons from the preaching ministry of Jesus. If you'd like to take notes, you can. If not, all nine of them are in chapter one of your book that we're going to be reviewing together. So, lesson number one. Preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at the text here. Uh, Read it with me from Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. Let's read it together. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach. Now, Jesus is about to go into ministry and He quotes from a 700-year-old prophecy from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach. I want to just challenge you with this thought at the very beginning of our hour. And that is, if you're called to preach, whether it's your first sermon or you've been preaching for many years, you should never preach without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The work that God wants to do is beyond our natural ability. So Jesus said, when I preach, I preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. And read this text with me from Acts 1. Let's read it together. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. Now, I know that's more than just preaching sermons, but it includes that. Our witness, when we proclaim, needs to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'd like you to share with me some examples from the New Testament. Who comes to your mind, and you say, that person preached in the power of the Holy Spirit? Anyone? John the Baptist. I mean, what an amazing man John the Baptist was. He preached a clear message of repentance, and people actually came and said, are you the Christ? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine someone coming saying, I've been watching you. Are you the Messiah? Are you the sent of God? He preached not only with his words, but also with his life. Thank you, Steve. Great one. Someone else. Who? Stephen is one of my heroes, Anthony. Uh, Stephen, uh, sometimes I, I wonder, I say, you know, not many people have threatened to kill me because my preaching was so powerful. But, and, and I'm not saying that we should all want to die young. But, you know, sometimes our preaching may be so weak that nobody bothers. No damage. Stephen preached. The Bible says he was full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom and preached with such power that the enemies of the cross of Christ, said, we've got to kill this man. Can you imagine that? Who else comes to your mind besides Stephen and John the Baptist? Peter. Uh, What a change from the coward who says, I don't even know who he is, to a person who says, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And we ought to obey God rather than men. So Peter's another wonderful example of someone preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit. Think of another one? Well, what about Paul? By the way, some of you say, well, Derek, I've only been a follower of Jesus for a short time. How, how long do you have to be a follower of Jesus before you can preach? Well, how many days was Peter a follower of Jesus before he started preaching? Anybody? What do you think? What did you say? Oh, no, 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 no. He started preaching long before three years. He did go off to Arabia for three years. How how long was he fasting and praying before the Ananias came and prayed for him? Three days, all right? And immediately after that, he begins to testify that Jesus is the Christ and he's so powerful that what did the enemies in Damascus try to do? How does he escape? basket over the wall, read in the book of Acts, he goes to Jerusalem. What does he do in Jerusalem? Preach. What do they try to do to him in Jerusalem? I mean, everywhere he goes, they try to kill him. Not just because he's obnoxious, you know. He's not just a kind of a horrible person. He's proclaiming the truth about Jesus. How? How? Power of the Holy Spirit. So if you just underline one thing and say, if I forget everything else this morning, if I'm called to preach, I will kneel and pray, God, please fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can preach, teach, give a worship. How? In the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that clear? 
That's really, really important. Some people say, well, give me the 12 steps. That's chapter 2 of the book. That's good. But before we talk about that, we need to have the preparation so we preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lesson number two. I, I, I search for another verb besides bathe. That may be hard to translate into some languages. Uh, saturate, cover your sermon preparation and delivery in prayer. That means pray when you're preparing your sermon and pray when you're preaching your sermon. You say, Derek, can you pray and preach at the same time? What's the answer? You better. You better pray. Pray while you preach. Pray while you're preparing. Bathe, cover, saturate your sermon preparation and delivery in prayer. Mark chapter 1. Did you bring your Bible with you? Mark 1.35 is a well-known text. It's about Jesus, long while before dawn, went to a solitary place, and there he what? He prayed. Thank you, Martina. But I want you to notice the context so, someone find Mark 1, 35. You say, well, that's a good text, so uh, don't forget to get up early and pray. That's good. But what people don't know is what that prayer was connected with. All right? Mark 1, 35. Martina, would you read that for us? And then read on. See what happens next. And Simon and those that were with him followed after him. And when he had found him, he said unto him, O man, seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next town that I may preach there. Oh, oh, hold it. Let us go into the next town that I may not visit, right? Tourist. No. That I may what? Preach. First he prays. And then he, did you get it? They're like, everybody needs you to do something. He says, no, no. First I need to pray, and then I'm going to... Do you see the correlation between those two? Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. Let's look at that together. The apostles are so busy. They are so busy. The church is growing. They've got to distribute food to everybody. And it's like, we've got to delegate responsibility to other people. We can't do all of this work. And uh, who has that verse? Verse 4. I have a volunteer would read it. Thank you. We will give ourselves continually. We will devote ourselves to two things. First, what? Prayer. And secondly, ministry of the Word. Now, would it be too bold for me to say that you should not minister the Word unless first you prayed? Did you see which one was first? What's first? Prayer, prayer and then ministry. the ministry of the word. So prayer and the ministry of the word go together. Ephesians 6, someone asked me yesterday, is it okay to ask people to pray for you? And the answer was, I do that all the time. My wife has been praying for me all weekend. The Apostle Paul, after the powerful passage of the armor of God in Acts 6, ends this. words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Fearlessly. Does someone have another translation for that word? Boldly. Boldly. Uh, fearlessly is good, but boldly is a precedent. Me, follow, pray for me so that when I preach, I preach oh. yeah. And that's not a human boldness, is it? That's, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. To pray for me. So, if you're asked to preach a sermon, a new preacher or a pastor, ask people to pray for you. Mm-hmm. Ask them to pray while you preach. You pray while you preach too, because Jesus set an example. Bathing, separate preparation, and delivery and prayer. You see how important that is? Sometimes I'll go to visit the church and they'll say, let's have a little prayer before you go up to preach. I'm like, brother, I need more than a little prayer. Sister, will you pray for me? Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
God will use me. So there's two vital lessons that we've learned from Jesus. Before we go on, lesson number one, we should preach how? Power of the Holy Spirit. Very good. And secondly, we should bathe, cover, saturate our preaching in what? In prayer. Lesson number three. We're just looking at the life of Jesus here. He was a master preacher. Preach the word of God instead of human opinions. Look at what Jesus said in John 14. Preach the word of God rather than human opinions. Read it with me, would you, from John 14. The word which you hear is not mine. Let's read it together. Start again. The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Jesus says, when I'm preaching, I'm not preaching my word, but the word of the one who sent me. And what did he say in the great prayer in John 17? Let's read it out loud together. I have given them what? I've given them your word. So, the apostles didn't just go out and preach their opinions. They preached the Word of God. In fact, Acts 4.31, I'd like someone to read. It's one of my favorite texts in the book of Acts. It actually combines the first three lessons we've learned. Preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, bathing our sermon preparation and delivery in prayer, and preaching the Word of God rather than human opinions. Who has Acts 4 and verse 31? And they're all in that one verse. See, we didn't make this up, did we? This is lessons from Jesus. And he shared that with his apostles and they learned it. So, remember those first three lessons, crucially important. But now I take you to lesson four. We've got nine lessons to cover together. Lesson number four, crucially important. When you preach, if you're preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, bathed in prayer, preaching the word, You must, you must communicate God's grace. Read this with me from Luke 4. They all bore witness to him, that's to Jesus, and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. In fact, John says about Jesus that Jesus was what? He's full of grace and truth. Wouldn't that be wonderful if someone said, you know, I heard, what's your first name? I heard Audrey preach today, and she was full of grace and truth. That'd be awesome. Heard David preach today, full of grace and truth. Heard Katya preach today, full of grace and truth. Grace. What, What is grace? What is grace? You know, if you read the beginnings of many of these epistles, you know how they begin? First Peter, Ephesians. How do they begin? Grace to you. Grace to you. Sometimes grace and peace. Grace to you. What is grace? I grew up, I grew up, uh, say grace. That was like, thank you for the food, you know, grace. Uh, that's not what grace is, right? What, what's grace? Gracious. Something we don't deserve. A gracious way of communicating. Gr- uh, and, you know, I'm not talking so much about style here, though I, I think what you're saying is true. I'm talking about actually the content, grace. What is grace? Doesn't it say in Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved. It is God's love, unmerited favor. It's His mercy. It's telling people that God, God what? He loves them. That's right. Some people think God hates them. Some people think God doesn't even exist. But I've got news for you. There is a God, and how does He feel about you? That's grace. How was that love revealed? Through Jesus. That's grace. You should never preach a sermon that is not filled with grace. You shouldn't do it. It may be the last time someone hears. And if they just walk away knowing that a tithe is 10% of their income, as blessed as you can be by returning tithe, but they've not heard any grace. Grace to you. 
So when you're preparing your biblical message, you're wanting to preach in the power of the Spirit, you're covering it in prayer, you're wanting to preach the Word of God, make sure there's good news. One time I wrote a sermon on 1 Corinthians 6 where it said, flee sexual immorality. And it talks about how when you get connected to it, it like sticks to you. It says flee that. The word flee there means like a fugitive, run for your life. And I wrote this sermon about (coughs) fleeing sexual immorality and I, I read it and I thought, something's wrong with it. Something's wrong with this sermon. Jimmy, I thought, what's wrong with this? And you know what it was? There was no grace. There's no grace. I thought, where's the grace? I mean, we all know that we should flee sexual immorality, shouldn't look at pornography, shouldn't be involved in illicit relation. We all know that. But where's the grace? What about the person who's in church who's been in all of that stuff? Where's the grace? And so I begin to say, God, where's the grace? And then I think of people like the woman caught in adultery. And Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. And as I began to write grace into the sermon, I began to weep. You say, you're, you're, a, you're a weakling, you know, you're weeping. No, God was touching my heart with his... And you know, if God touches your heart as the preacher, is there a pretty good chance that God will use you to touch other hearts. I mean, if it's just cold, lifeless words that doesn't even touch your heart, why would it change anybody else's heart? Let your speech always be with grace. Share the good news with them. Tell them about the Sabbath. But tell them the Sabbath's important because God loves them and wants to rest with them. And he showed that love in the coming of Jesus. Tell them that Jesus is coming again and it will be visible and audible and dramatic and you can list all of the things that we do when we preach about the coming. But tell them the one who's coming back loves them and wants them to be saved. Grace. Jesus communicated with grace. Well, we're going to go into the advanced level now, okay? What do we have so far? What's the first lesson? Power of the Holy Spirit. Second lesson, prayer. Cover it with prayer. Third lesson, preach the word, right? Rather than human opinions. And fourth lesson, God's grace. Communicate God's grace. Now, you could say, Derek, that's enough. I've got four lessons. If you applied that, God would bless your preaching. Because these are lessons from Jesus. But I'm going to take you to some advanced stuff, okay? You with me? Lesson number five, be aware of your audience. Um. Have you noticed that when I preach, I don't stand behind a big piece of wood and read? Our text today is taken from Luke chapter 10 and verse 2. Jesus said, the harvest truly is great. And maybe if I go like this every once in a while. um, I don't know who invented these big pieces of wood, especially for small people like me. It's like my head's just appearing over the top, you know. So... Communicators get out from behind big things and they don't read. They, they, they look at people, right? Why is that important? Well, let, let's learn from Jesus. Jesus, when he taught, he, he, he was noticing what was happening. He was aware of his audience. Uh, in uh, Luke 4, he's in the synagogue in Nazareth and he's just said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach. And they marveled at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. So at first they're like, wow. And then their body language changes. It doesn't tell us that in the text, but their words give them away. Having said, wow, look at the gracious words. Then then the body language changes and they go, is is this not the carpenter's son? And I, I, you know, Isn't that what it says in verse 23? Uh, And Jesus notices their body language. And he says, uh, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, physician, heal yourself. In other words, prove it. Oh, it's gracious words. Wait a minute. This guy just lives down the road. Prove it. Do you see how Jesus is aware of his audience? He's noticing their body language. In fact, amazing story in Luke chapter 12. 
of Jesus being aware of his audience. He's preaching a sermon about God and judgment, and someone actually interrupts his sermon. Uh, excuse me, would you tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me? Totally unrelated to the sermon. Interrupts the sermon. Would you tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me? And Jesus actually changes the sermon because of the interruption. Why didn't he just say, uh, excuse me, brother, would you just wait until after the sermon? I'll talk to you about your brother. Why do you think he changes and begins to talk about a rich fool who built a bigger barn and, and then he dies and, and you need to lay up treasure in heaven rather than worry about treasure? That's not what his sermon was about at all before. Why do you think he changed his sermon? Just because someone interrupted him. Anybody want to take a guess? It's what they needed. I think you're right, Steve, but unpack that some more. What happened when the guy interrupted his sermon? Yes, but why Why didn't he just say, just wait till later? Come on now. Ah, uh, 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 uh. everybody else is like, whoa. Oh, yeah, I, I know Ebenezer, you know. Uh, go over there, right? I know him. Boy, those guys have been fighting about that. And they're all focused on that. So Jesus, being a master communicator, instead of going, hey, pay attention, pay att- forget about that. Pay, pay att-, he says, listen, let's just talk about this. Is that amazing? I mean, so aware of his audience that, that he says, Let's talk about that, because everybody's thinking about it. And he talks about laying up treasure on heaven, in heaven rather than on the earth. I just got an emergency message that I need to plug in the computer. So I should have remembered that, but I, I've got a friend here on row two. You can plug that in for me. Thank you very much. That's a little difficult to plug in. All right, so be aware of your audience is uh, the next lesson. Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost and he says, God has made this Christ whom you crucified, uh, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, and they come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and they say, brothers, what shall we do? Do you know they're actually interrupting his sermon but not changing the subject like the other guy? They're actually going, oh, preacher, what shall we do? Just goes right on the side there. Yeah, we know what that is. What shall we do? And Peter, instead of saying, wait, wait till I'm done with my sermon, because it says later, with this and many other words, he exhorted them to save themselves from this, what's the word, something generation, this, huh? Perverse generation, thank you. But because they call him and say, what shall we do? He stops. He notices their response. And he says, what's the word? Repent and be baptized. So Peter is aware of his audience. He's not just reading here. He's looking. People are going, I was preaching last Sabbath in Mauritius. And uh, I had a funeral there on Sunday. And to, at the end of the sermon, I forgot lesson nine that we're going to sh- share today. I forgot it. And, 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 and we're now singing the closing hymn. And I look out and there's a woman and tears are just running down her cheeks. And the Spirit of God said to me, stop the singing. <laughs> What are you going to do? My brother back there says, stop the singing. (laughs) Because you're not only praying while you prepare, but you're also praying when you... Right? So I'm praying all the time. The Spirit of God says, stop the singing. So I didn't stop like right here. Stop, stop. I just waited till the end of the verse and I just walked up and said, you know, the Spirit of God has convicted me that I need to make a simple appeal today. Do you know more than a hundred people came forward? Be aware of your audience. She didn't shout out, what shall we do? How did she call out? With her tear. 
If I'm just behind the big piece of wood reading, I can't see that, can I? Now, I know some of you will say, but Derek, I may forget some of the things that I've written out. I, I'm going to tell you 12 steps in chapter 2. I believe I write out my sermons word for word. I believe in the discipline of doing that. But you know what? If I forget a few things, it doesn't matter if I've connected with the person. Is that right? So, so look at people. Notice their body language. That's what Jesus did. That's what the apostles did. Crucially important. All right. If you forget everything else, lesson six, actually lesson one through five are important too. But if you want to be a powerful biblical preacher, you must, you must remember and implement lesson six. How many of you were with me on Friday night here for the first meeting? What was my simple, memorable statement? A plus. You say, duh, that's what Jesus said. You're right. That's why I said it, because I'm not sharing human opinions, but the simple, memorable statement. Notice Jesus preaches after he's fed the 5,000 and they come and say, could we have some more fish sandwiches, please? And he says, "Um, you know what? You don't understand. Your forefathers, they got free food for 40 years and they died. I'm going to give you something that will enable you to live forever. I am the bread of life. That is a simple, memorable statement. Notice it's simple rather than complex. Jesus would say, even though people are looking for nourishment everywhere else, and some of you have looked and failed many times in your lives, I am the bread of life. Just get all of that other stuff out of the way. A simple, memorable statement. Now, obviously, if I was preaching this sermon from John chapter 6, I wouldn't say, and there's one thing I want you to remember today. I am the bread of life. No, 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 no. Because I'm not Jesus, right? But I only have to make a simple change and I say, there's one thing I want you to remember today. And what is it? Some of you are trying to find comfort in your investments. Some of you are trying to find comfort in your addictions. But I want to tell you today, that Jesus is the only source of hope and nourishment. Jesus is the bread of life. Get it? Simple sentence. Do you notice also that it's positive rather than negative? So, I don't say there's one thing I want you to remember tonight. The harvest isn't small. That's negative. The harvest isn't small. Or if I'm talking to you about fidelity, I'm not going to say there's one thing I want you to remember. Don't be unfaithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. The harvest is great. Do you see it's positive? One thing I want you to remember as you leave church today, Buddha is not the bread of life. Amen. And people walk out going, Buddha is not bread of life. Who is? Right? So again, you're working on your sermon. Lesson number one, preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lesson number two, prayer. But Lesson number three, preach the word of God rather than human opinions. Lesson number four, communicate God's grace. Lesson number five, be aware of your audience. Lesson number six, simple, memorable statement. Now, I have a question for you. How do we help people to remember that simple, memorable statement? That is lesson number seven. You're right. Audrey. Lesson number seven. Just learn from Jesus. There are two ways that you can help people to remember that simple, memorable statement. Could you just say it one time and have people remember it? 
Very rarely. I mean, that's pretty risky, isn't it? I mean, what what if, um, you know, Hadassah just went, Wah! right when, when I made my main statement, you know, and you went, oh, I missed it. Or, uh, you know, you just doze off for a second. You probably can't just say it once. Even if I said, if you forget everything else today, remember this. Everybody awake, remember this. The harvest truly is great. Probably, that's still a bit risky. I need to use what? Repetition and? John 6.35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Someone look at John 6.48. Got your Bible. John 6 and verse 48. John 6 and verse 48. What does it say? I am the bread of life. You said, he said that already. Why is he saying it again? Why is he saying it again? Why is he repeating it? Because he wants them to remember it because it's his single powerful main idea, right? But now look at John 6.41. John 6.41, what does that say? John 6.41. Okay, so there Jesus had re, apparently restated. What's the difference between repetition and restatement? Repetition is, same words. Restatement is, different words, same same idea, right? Same idea, different words. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. I am the bread which came down from heaven. You see that? That's a restatement of the same idea. What about John six fifty one? I am the living bread. What is that? That's restatement too, right? I am the bread of life. I am the bread which came down from heaven. I am the living bread. I am the bread of life. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence when I said, as you leave tonight, I want you to remember five words. I am, not sure why that did that, uh, Jimmy. Maybe you, you can check and see. I don't think that's related to my computer. Um, I wasn't insulting your intelligence by saying, I want you to remember five words tonight. I am the... Bread of life. Okay, we're going to keep going here while we try to figure this out. That was lesson number seven, right? So, seven. Repetition and restatement is lesson seven, okay? So, we're going to go to lesson eight, and we're going to keep trying to find the computer, but I need to keep going, right? So, lesson number eight, find practical illustrations. I had someone say to me one time, I don't use illustrations. I just preach the word. And I thought, what an insult to the preaching ministry of Jesus. Jesus always used illustrations. By the way, you know where a lot of great illustrations are found? In the word. I don't know what the person was saying. He was saying, I just want to talk abstract or something. But there are many stories. Did I lose power? You know what? I think we plugged, we, we hooked it up, but it didn't actually connect. So it died. Okay. There are many great stories in the Bible. If you're talking about fleeing temptation, what would be a great illustration from the Bible? Joseph. I mean, it's a great illustration. So why don't you use illustrations? Uh, Matthew 13 and verse 34. I have to reboot. Is it? You go. It's coming, okay. Matthew 13 and verse 34. Anybody have that would read it for us. Matthew 13 and verse 34. All these things spoke Jesus in parables. What's a parable? It's an illustration, right. Uh, thank you so much. He spoke them in parables and it says... Without parables, I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, it's not responding here, but let's see if we can do it manually. Is it frozen? It's actually frozen. Uh, 
Maybe you can try to see if you can manually advance it. Without parables, he didn't, he didn't teach them. So Jesus constantly is using illustrations. My translation is like this. Jesus always used stories and illustrations. Great. What a, no, not yet. We'll keep, keep trying. Uh, Jesus always used illustrations. Okay? We may have to just reboot it. So, help me now. If illustrations are important... How do I know, this is really important, you got it now, right? Yeah, it works. There we go. Thank you. Well, it's working manually. I mean, it's working. I'll just do it. Yeah. Let me just use it this way. I'll just, I'll just use my finger. It's okay. <laughs> Where do I find good illustrations? Well, before I ask that, how do I know if an illustration is good or not? Some people just tell a story and you go, why did they tell that story? How do, how do I choose illustrations before I know where to find them? What, to what? Come on now, be more specific. Exactly, thank you. Get it, get it really specific. That single powerful idea is what you're trying to illustrate, right? So whatever that main sentence is, that's what your illustration is pointing to. That's why you're going to let go of the illustration about the lady who missed the bus because you're not talking about that, even though you go, well, it's kind of cute, you know, because it just becomes a distraction. So you're choosing an illustration that points to the main idea. Where am I going to find them? Exactly. In fact, sometimes it's probably uh, generous. Maybe always in life itself would be better. Someone says to me, can you recommend the best book of illustrations? I say, no. No. Because the best place to find an illustration is where your life and the life of your listener intersect. So if I talk about I was walking down the road yesterday and I looked up and I saw Wallace Monument towering above the houses there. Most of you will know what I'm talking about. Wallace Monument is here in Sterling, and it was built 120 years ago, whatever, and it commemorates the Battle of Sterling. Uh, if I say in the 17th century French court, most of you go, if I get it close to our lives, if I talk about a challenge I had with my son yesterday or a struggle that I had making it through traffic this afternoon, I'm close to where you live. So I, I think you're absolutely right. As close to life as possible. Now, the best place to find the illustration is where they overlap. Where's the second best place to find illustrations in this schematic? If the best place is right in the middle, where's the second best place? The life of the listener. That's right. I'm trying to relate to you. Uh, is it ever appropriate to share something from the life of the speaker? Absolutely. I can share my personal experience, my testimony, right? Where's the worst place to find illustrations? Out here, somewhere, in a book, right? Right? I mean, it better be really, really good if you're finding it out here somewhere. The best place to find it is right where the lives connect together. But Jesus always used illustrations and stories, as your translation put it. The key is to make sure the illustration sheds light on the main idea, right? The main idea. If it doesn't, save it for another day. You know, people start collecting illustrations before they know what they're going to say. Huh? Oh, I've got to preach in a few weeks. I've got a couple of great stories. So about what? First, you have to find that main idea. And then illustrations will start jumping out at you. Hey, I illustrate what you're talking about. Last lesson. Got a few minutes to close. What have we got so far? You, have, you got, have you got eight so far? What's lesson number one? Preach in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Lesson number two? Cover it all in prayer. When you prepare and when you preach, right? Lesson number three? Communicate God's word rather than human opinions. 
Lesson number four. Communicate God's grace. Lesson number five. Be aware of your audience. Lesson number six. Simple, memorable statement. By the way, there's a whole chapter in my book on that one point because it's so important. I think it's chapter eight. Uh, it's called Bullets or Buckshot. Even my children, when they were little, if they heard a sermon that was well-crafted and the single powerful idea, they would come back and say, Daddy, that was a bullet. You know the difference between bullet and buckshot, right? Buckshot just stings. <laughs> bullet <laughs> penetrates, impact. That's what God wants your sermon to be. So six, single powerful idea. How do I, how do I make people, help people remember that? Lesson seven, I use what? Repetition and restatement. All right. Lesson number eight, find practical illustrations, right? Okay. And now lesson number nine, call for radical life change. For some reason, I wonder if it's a little battery in here that died. Matthew seven, Jesus has just finished his great sermon on the mount. And he says, I want you to live what you've heard. That's his appeal. I want you to live what you've heard. If you do what you've heard, you're like a wise person who builds on rock. If you don't do what you've heard, you're like a foolish person who builds where? I want you to live what you heard. So Jesus, whenever he preached... And by the way, if you preached in the power of the Holy Spirit, Dwayne, bathed in prayer, communicated the Word of God with grace, you've noticed your audience, you've driven home a main idea, you've, you've um, repeated it, and you've illustrated it, shouldn't you call people to respond to that? Right? It's like, call people to respond to that Word they've heard. That's what the apostles did, like Peter. What shall we do? And he didn't say, well, go home and have lunch. Go home and have lunch. What shall we do? He said, repent. Change. Turn. Be baptized. Accept, accept Jesus. The call should be simple and clear. I don't know if you've ever had someone make an appeal and you don't know what they were saying. And you thought you better stand up because if you didn't, maybe it meant you didn't love Jesus. But you're not really sure what they were asking. You know, it's kind of muddled. Okay? If you have the courage today to say, Lord, I, I, I want to radically depend upon you, I just want to invite you to raise your hand. Do you say it's clear? Yeah, I'm not making an appeal. Thank you. Candace, God bless you. <laughs> You know, it was clear enough that she raised her hand, right? I want to invite you to respond. Someone stands up, another person kneels, someone comes forward, they, they don't know what they're doing. Or even worse, you say, and if uh, God has spoken to you today, about what? May God help us to get something out of this message. And the hearers are going, yes, may God help us. <laughs> I don't know what you were talking about. Simple idea, drive it home, but then call people to respond. Well... God uh, God has to remind me of that. Sometimes, I don't know, we forget the basic lessons. So just, you might say, Derek, I've heard this before. And I'd say, great, do it. Live what you've heard. I preached a sermon from Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 is a story about the friends who tore up the roof to lower their friend down to Jesus. Powerful story. And I talked about, it, the, the sermon was called Stretcher Bearers, and it was about the ministry of carrying people to Jesus, kind of thing you're doing once a month in the middle of the night, you know, Stretcher Bearers. And I shared that story, and it was a compelling story, and I had some beautiful illustrations of that powerful idea, I thought. And, I, and yet I did not make a specific appeal at the end of the sermon. And we're singing the closing hymn. This happened... This, this happens to me every once in a while. It happened to me in Mauritius. We're singing the closing hymn, and the Spirit of God says, I want you to make an appeal for people to accept Jesus. And I began to argue. Have you ever argued with God? I began to argue. I'm saying, God, I don't know these people. I'm a visitor here. 
this is not where I preach. I'm a guest, and 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 you want me to stop the hymn? He said, yep, stop. I want you to invite people to accept Jesus. So at the end of the first stanza of the hymn, I walk back and I turn to the organist. Here's the keyboardist here. And I just went like this. You know? What does that mean? Huh? Just just kind of play quietly, right? I mean, he got it. It's like we've been working together for years. They got it. And I walked up to the microphone. I said, I just have to tell you, the Spirit of God just impressed me to give a simple invitation for people who need to accept Jesus as their Savior. I want to invite you. We're going to keep singing. And I just invite you to come. Is that clear? I want to invite you to come forward. Simple, right? We start singing the second stanza of the hymn, and about five rows back, a young man in his mid-twenties pops up, comes walking up to the front. Young man walks up to the front. And then 15 people stood up. Like popcorn. They come in forward. And I'm like, wow. They come to the front. And I pray for the whole congregation and for them. And I think I need to talk to these people, right? Claudio, you need to kind of find out what's going on for these people, right? Don't just say a little prayer. So there was a little room to the side where the mothers could sit with their children. And I said to these 15 people, could we just meet for a few minutes right after the service and we'll talk together? So we did. So they came over. Do you know what I found out? I found out that more than half of them were not members of that church. But they got up that, that morning and said, I just felt impressed by God to go to that church today. Wow. Wow. And then there was that young man. You remember the fellow that stood up right? right? He came up to me. He said, I want to tell you something. He said, when we were singing the hymn, I noticed that you were troubled. And he said, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, I'm troubling him to make a call. And that young man said, if he makes a call, I will go forward. Now I have a question for you. Would that young man have been lost if I hadn't made the call? Careful now. Careful before you respond. What do you know about God and his grace and his mercy and his love? Would that man have been lost if I hadn't made the call that day? No, 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 please. Don't make God like that. He'd have, he, he'd have broken down all kinds of barriers and used some little girl on the street or someone, right? The stones will cry out if they need to. I don't believe he'd have been lost. But what would have happened if I had not been attentive to that simple invitation to give a call? What would have happened? Well, I might not have regretted it because I wouldn't have known, but something would have happened. What would have happened? I What would have happened? I would have what? Okay, so there would have been a reduced impact for sure, but what about for me? What would have happened? I would have what? Huh? I don't know if I... I might have regretted it later if I... I would have missed the the blessing, right? I mean, do you think I was blessed when that young man came forward? Do you think I was blessed when he told me what had happened during that time? Do you think I was blessed when I discovered that half of the people weren't even members there? God brought them there that day? I would have missed the blessing. So, and I'll get them to a Q&A here. So, if you've preached a clear word of God, you've illustrated it, you've driven it home, Call people to respond. And when they do, all of the glory goes to God.
Okay, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Did you follow the nine lessons? All right, that's chapter one of the book. You've got 28, 26 chapters of study questions. Chapter two is the second essential chapter. If you just read those two, you've got everything you need, the basic framework. Let's take some a couple of minutes for questions. First, uh, Basically, I yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. You know, you're absolutely right because God not only blessed me that day, but I've shared that illustration numerous places where people have said, I've got, I've got to, do, I've got, got to give an invitation, right? So, yeah, we'd have missed many blessings, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Sure, you can. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So I could say maybe there's someone here today, you've never accepted Jesus. I want to invite you today to make that decision. And in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come forward. But there may be some of you who you've trusted Jesus, but you've wandered away. And you want to come back. And today's your day. Yeah? And people may come forward. And I'll say, you know, before we pray, is there someone here in the congregation and there's someone you know and love who's wandered from Jesus, and you, you want to pray for that person as we pray. I want to invite you to raise your hand. I've actually, but each one of those is clear, right? Now, I, I wouldn't have 17, but, you know, if it's all related to people coming to Jesus in different places, absolutely. Thank you. And some of you have done that, right? You've had an application like that uh, where, where it applies to different groups of people. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we don't give a call because we're afraid no one will respond. You know what? That's not our responsibility. That's God's responsibility. Now, if I say, is there anyone that needs to trust Christ today? And no one comes, I say, you know, praise God. It looks like everybody here is trusting Jesus. Do you know someone who needs to come to Christ and you want to pray for them today? Let me see your hand. And probably 200 hands will go up, see? So I can, even at that time, what am I doing? What was lesson number five? I'm being aware of my audience, right? Nobody responds to the call to come forward. It's great. Praise God. If I said, is there anyone here who has not accepted Jesus, made a call, probably no one would come forward. If I said, is there anyone here who has a loved one or friend that needs to know Jesus, would anyone besides me raise your hand? Yeah? See what I'm saying? So I'm aware. Thank you. Anyone else? Time has gone quickly. Great group. Thank you so much. Uh, what, one question back here. When you, when you create a sermon, And actually, I, I dialogued with, with your president who said, what are the needs here in Scotland and, and what's his vision? What does he see needs to happen? And because I come as a servant, not as a, what? Showman or whatever. I don't know. I come as a servant, a servant to this mission. And so there's some guidance about what, what I should speak about. But yes, you know, if I share an illustration uh, for the children about... Uh, Bobby Morrison, whose daddy was Scottish and his mother was English, that's getting pretty close to home. Or if I share a story about the voice of prophecy in Bristol, which is on this same you know, island, um, that may work better th- than if I was in Illinois. So I'm going to illustrate it differently, but the word of the text remains the same. Good point. doing the invitation. Yeah. Well, it's a bit scary. We're going to take a um, 10 or so minute break. If any, let me just give a brief announcement before we do it, if I can. Uh, I have five of these. They're, they're regularly, I think, six pounds and they're three pounds. If any of you are interested, there's five of them. It covers the 12 steps and a lecture on presentation and delivery. I also have... Uh, your president asked me to bring a few resources. This is the full Radical Prayer book, and uh, that that is available. The, all of the little books are three pounds each, which is about half price. Uh, there's four in the series. If any of you are interested, I only have five of them. So if any of you are interested in those, and after the break, when I speak, we have a worship service starts at 11.15, I'm going to talk to you about memorizing Scripture, and I brought some uh, scripture CDs. I gave a few away yesterday. I'll talk to you about those later, but those may run out 
because they're going to they're going to be available uh, at that time. So I didn't obviously share any of that with you yesterday because of Sabbath. I just gave them away. But there are some at a very reasonable price. If you want to look at them during the break, I'll tell you about that when the meeting begins. But just a few preaching resources. And could I just pray with you before we close? Because, um, you know, I know our president here is praying that God will raise up many powerful biblical preachers. And many of you are that. Uh, I don't offend you or want to by saying, you don't know anything and I'm coming to tell you everything. But you may learn something here that will move you to the next level. And that, that that's my prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of sharing your word. Take these principles from the preaching ministry of Jesus and please apply them to each of our hearts. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.